Hi, my name is Phil Sugar. I'm a guitarist and composer. And today I'm going to be talking about simplifying modal theory for improvisers. And so something some people don't consider sometimes is that when you are a composer, you have time to think about complex modal concepts and work with them. So you can develop ideas over a long period of time um, because you're sitting at your desk composing or you're out walking and contemplating ideas about your daily life. But as an improviser, you need to have direct access to um, concepts when you're improvising. You don't have time to really think about the complexities of theory while you're sitting on stage and the music's flying by fast. You know, by the time you've thought about parent modes or these various concepts, the chord change is already by you and you know, you've lost the form and people have moved on musically. And so what we're going to do today is talk about how to take all of this complex modal theory and break it into something very simple, very practical, and applicable immediately to your playing. Um, so to start off, we're just going to look at the structures of the various modes. And what I have here on the board are the harmonic structures of several of the various modes. So we have the major scale modes, melodic minor modes, harmonic minor modes, symmetric diminished, and whole tone modes, which are the five primary scales um, people tend to improvise with if you think in terms of scales, which, which is something I'll get to later. Um, this is a lot of content to take in, and as an improviser, to be holding all of this in your head while you're trying to play over changes and, and the drummer's killing it and everything's going on is way too much to process. Um, we need to kind of come up with a way to simplify that, and so I'll get to that as we go through this and describe it, and then talk about how to do that directly with chord sounds. So let's start off with what the individual chord sounds are. Um, first, with the one chord in the major scale modes, this would be the Ionian mode. And the sound of the Ionian mode is a major 7 sound with a 9, 11, and 13. So the extensions are the 9, the 11, and the 13. The Dorian mode, or the 2 chord, is a minor 7 sound, and it has a natural 9, 11, and natural 13. And then next we have the Phrygian mode, which is also a minor 7 sound, but in this case, you have the flat 9, 11, and flat 13. So if you look at these two sounds next to each other, they're kind of like polar opposites and diametrically opposed. And this is what makes them unique in their sound. Here in the Dorian mode, you have a natural 9 and a natural 13. And then in the Phrygian mode, you get a flat 9 and a flat 13. And so those notes are the key notes in that mode to making that chord sound come out and making it you know, get its char characteristic sound. Uh, next we have the Lydian mode, which is a major 7 chord with a 9, sharp 11, and 13. And so if you look back at the 1 chord, the Ionian mo mode, you have a major 7 chord with a natural, nine, uh, natural 11 and a natural 13. In this case, then, the characteristic note for the Lydian mode is going to be the sharp 11. So that's the pitch that's really going to give the character sound of, the, of that mode. Next we have the Mixolydian mode, which has a natural 9, 11, and 13. And so here, what the difference between this is, if you think of it as a major mode, so you have your major mode here, Ionian, and then you have Mixolydian. If you notice, the extensions of both of these chords are the same. You have a natural 9, 11, and 13 here, natural 9, 11, and 13 here. The note that uh, defines the characteristic of Mixolydian is the flat 7. So that's going to be the key note in making that mode come alive. Um, next, we have another minor 7 sound, which is the Aeolian mode. This is natural 9, 11, and flat 13. And so here, this is kind of like a compromise between Phrygian and Dorian. Uh, Dorian had natural 9, 11, and 13. Phrygian had flat 9, 11, and flat 13. And then here, with the Aeolian sound, you have the natural 9, 11, and just the flat 13. And then finally, we have the Locrian sound, which would be a half-diminished seventh chord with flat 9, 11, and flat 13. And so if you notice here, we have different sets of sounds. We have major seven sounds. We have minor seven sounds, and then you have a dominant seven sound to work with, and a half diminished sound. And so these are four of our five primary um, seventh chord family, seventh chords of our, of our seventh chord family. You have the major seven sound, the dominant seven sound, minor seven, half diminished, and then fully diminished. If we move on then to the melodic minor modes, so if you notice what um, the major scale modes are lacking are, is options for the dominant 7 sound. So you have multiple options here for your minor 7 sounds. You have two options here for your major 7 sound, but you only have one option for your dominant 7 sound, and that's the Mixolydian mode. What's unique about the mel melodic minor modes is that they're going to give you three options now for dominant 7 sounds. So that will expand 
um, the possibilities for that chord family. So here, first you have a minor major 7 chord with 9, 11, and 13. That's the first mode. Your 2 chord is a minor 7 chord. And here you have a flat 9, 11, and 13. And then uh, the 3 chord is a major 7 sharp 5 with a natural 9, sharp 11, and 13. Your 4 chord is a dominant 7 sound. This is with a 9, sharp 11, and 13. So here if you look between the difference between the 5 chord here, which is a dominant 7 with a 9, 11, and 13, here you have a dominant 7 with a 9, a sharp 11, and 13. So this will be the characteristic pitch for that. And this is sometimes called Lydian dominant. Okay, And then you have um, the 5 chord in, in melodic minor. It has a natural 9, 11, and flat 13. So again, the characteristic pitch would be this flat 13 sound. Here the 6th chord is a half diminished sound with a natural 9, 11, and flat 13. And then finally your 7th chord is an altered, it's an altered dominant is how it's referred to as a flat 9, sharp 9, flat 5, and sharp 5 without a perfect 5th in it. Then we move on to the harmonic minor modes. So here again we have a minor major 7 sound, and this is a 9, 11, and flat 13 are the extensions. Your 2 chord is a half diminished sound with flat 9, 11, and flat 13. Uh, your 3 chord is a major 7 sharp 5 with a natural 9, natural 11, and 13. So if you look at the difference between your two major 7 sharp 5 chords, here you have the sharp 11, here you have a natural 11. And so that's how those are differentiated. Here you get another minor 7 sound, uh, which is a really cool sound. It's a minor 7 with natural 9, sharp 11, and 13. So you get this sharp 11 sound in there. It's very unique. And then you get a dominant 7 sound on your 5 chord here. And that has flat 9, 11, and flat 13, which this is a very um, iconic sound. You hear this used a lot, whether you know it or not. It's a, it's a very characteristic sound as a dominant 7 sound. And then your 6th chord um, is a major 7 chord with a sharp 9, sharp 11, and 13. Again, a very unique uh, version of a major 7 chord to kind of complement our Lydian and Ionian modes. And then uh, the seventh chord is a fully diminished seventh with a flat nine, flat 11, and flat 13. And then next, if we move on to the symmetric diminished scale, um, in this case, I'm doing it as a half whole diminished. There are other ways to spell this, this scale. Uh, you can spell it whole half, but it's, it still gives the same harmonic structure. Just, so just for simplicity's sake, I've broken it into the half whole diminished. And so the one chord in half whole diminished would be a dominant seven sound, with a flat 9, sharp 9, sharp 11, and 13. Um, this is also called the octatonic scale because it has eight notes in it, and so that's where the extra note comes from in this case. And then um, the two chord in that scale would be, uh, it's, a ha it's like a, a diminished triad, so you'd have one flat 3 and flat 5 with a major 7, and then you have a natural 9, 11, flat 13, and 13. Now if you notice, I didn't go through and um, spell out the rest of the chords in the scale, and the reason why is because this is a symmetric scale, and the chord structure just repeats itself. So if we went along, you'd have one, and then flat two, and then your next chord in line would just be the same as this harmonically. So you're going to have um, a dominant seven with a flat nine, a sharp nine, sharp 11, and 13. And then the, f the chord following that would be this chord structure again. So these harmonic structures just repeat themselves, and that's why I haven't written anything further on here. And then finally, with the whole tone scale, so the whole tone scale only gives one chord sound, uh, and all the chord sounds are the same for all of the scale degrees. So it's a dominant 7 with a flat 5, with a natural 9, and a flat 13. And in this case, it's only six tones because it is a six-tone scale. Um, there are a couple different ways to think about this. You could think of it as an augmented, you know, a sharp 5 with a, with a sharp 11, but it doesn't really matter. This is the simplified version here. You have a dominant 7, flat 5, with a natural 9, and a flat 13, and there's no perfect fifth in that chord. So if you take in everything I just said, that is a lot to process. It's a lot to think about. And so what I want to do from here is show you how to simplify all of that into something very concise, into a system in which you can move in and out of any of these structures with ease and immediacy. And so from here, we're going to kind of take a look at the chromatic scale. And so if we look at the chromatic scale laid out, this is just in C, and it could be any key, but we're going to look at how to spell chords from the chromatic scale. And so if you take start on C and make that your 1, right? So you have 1 here, and then your a half step from that would be your flat 2. Um, and then as we extend our chord out, you would have 2, uh, 4, and 6 become 9, 11, and 13. And so if you think of this like a number line, your basic spelling of chords is 1, 3, 5, and 7. And then following that number line would then be 9, 11, and 13. So 2, 4, and 6 are 9, 11, and 13. And that's why I've 
notated them in, in both ways here. So here you'd have C would be 1, and then your flat 2 would be B flat, and then here I've written that as flat 9 as well, so you have the reference for that. Your natural 9 would be D, and then your sharp 9 would be D sharp. Um, and that would also be your flat 3. So sharp 9 is only possible on a dominant 7 or major 7 chord because it's um, also the flat 3rd, so any sort of minor or diminished chord you would not be able to have a sharp 9 on. <coughs> and then you have your major 3rd, you have your perfect 4th, which is the 11, and then you have your sharp 4, or your tritone, which is the sharp 11. And you have your perfect 5th, and then you have flat 6 and 6, which are flat 13 and 13. And then you have your sevens. You have a flat seven and then your uh, major seven. Okay. So as far as chord spellings go then, here was what you have of your five families. So for the seventh chords, you have one, three, five, and seven for a major seven chord. So in this case, that would give us C. E would be the major third. G is the fifth. And then the major seven is a half step from your root. So that would be a B in this case. So the spelling of C major seven would be C, E, G, B. To make that into a dominant 7 chord, then, you're just going to change one thing. You're going to alter what the 7 is, so you have a flat 7 in this case. So you still have C, E would still be the 3rd, G is your 5th, and then here you have your flat 7, which would be a B flat. So the spelling of that chord would be C, E, G, B flat. And then you have your minor 7, so in this case, then, we're going to lower the 3rd, and then you have a, the flatted 7 as well. So you have your C here, E flat would be the flat 3, G is 5, and then you have your flat 7, which is B flat. And then for a half diminished 7th chord, you are going to lower the 3rd, lower the 5th, and lower the 7th. So you would have C here, E flat, and then G would be G flat in this case, because you're going to flat the 5th, you're going to lower it. And then you have B flat, which will be your flat 7. And then finally, for the fully diminished 7th chord, you have 1, flat 3, flat 5, and then a double flat 7, which is also the equivalent of a 6, just depending on how you want to think about it. Being theoretically correct, it would be a double flat at 7, but that's a lot to say, so sometimes thinking of it as the 6 just um, simplifies the thing. So in this case, you'd have C, E flat, uh, G flat here is your flat 5, and then if you're going to double flat the 7, so this would be flat 7, that goes down to 6, and so you would be having there as A if we want to use the enharmonic spelling just to simplify things. Okay, so now what this brings me to then is this broader chord spelling chart. So if you can spell a basic triad for all 12 keys, you know, regardless of what key you're in, whether you're in C, F, or B flat, and so on, if you can spell your basic triad, from that you can figure out all of your extensions by just looking at the half steps, half steps and whole steps on either side of your root third and fifth. And so this is where things become much simpler if you can start to think like this and process like this. So if we have C here, if we have a C chord, it's 1, 3, and 5, so that would be C, E, and G. Right? And then a half step below that is going to be the major 7. A half step below your root, that is, will be the major 7. A half step below your, or a whole step below your root is going to be your flat 7. So if you need a flat 7 in your chord spelling, you just look for what's a whole step below your root. And then when you're looking for your 9, a half step above your root is going to be the flat 9, and a whole step above your root is going to be the natural 9. Now, what this has with it is it has not only is it telling you how to arrange things in relationship to the triad, but it's also showing you the voice leading of where th these um, notes tend to resolve, which is very important for making your modal sounds sound good and your playing in general sound good, is that you have the tendency, you understand the tendency towards resolution. So seven tends to resolve to one, and then flat seven also tends to resolve to one. And so with resolutions, your half-step resolution is always going to be a stronger pull than a whole-step resolution. There's more of a, a tension there. And so if you're looking at your nines then, flat nine is a half-step above the root, so that's going to have a little bit more tension to it. And then you'd have your natural nine, which would also drop down to the root. And as I'm talking about these resolutions, um, these are tendencies. You don't have to do these things, but they're built into our, um, our oral structures from our earliest childhood. You've heard these things your entire life. There's nothing foreign about it. It's just recognizing what you've been listening to. And so from your third then, um, a half step below your third is your uh, flat three or the minor third, but that's also the sharp nine. And so the tendency of that sharp nine, if we're going to use it, is going to be to pull into the three. That's where it's going to resolve. And then the 11, that's the four resolving to three. And so that's the tendency of that resolution. Um, and then moving on to your fifth, 
you have on either side of that your 11 and 13. So the sharp 11 is going to tend to pull into the 5, and then the 11, 11 has a stronger pull towards 3, but it can also pull up to 5 by a half step or, or a whole step. Again, that's that half step versus whole step resolution. And then you have your flat 13, which pulls towards the 5th, and it's a half step above, and your natural 13 that pulls towards the 5th, but that's a whole step resolution. Now, with this chord spelling chart right here, this represents the totality of everything that's on the board. So if you can think in these terms, you have immediate access to all of this without thinking about parent scales, without thinking about which mode this came out of, but the direct application of a chord sound. So if you know that you want to play a dominant 7 with a sharp 11, then you know that you're just going to play root 3rd and 5th, so if we're in C, you'd have C, E, G, B flat, and then your sharp 11 is going to be F sharp. And where is that sharp 11 going to pull as you're playing it? It's going to have the tendency to pull into the 5. And so with that in mind, you know, I, I could think to myself, I could immediately, immediately reference that and say, oh yeah, that's a, you know, the 4 chord of melodic minor. And then if you're thinking, where does that come from? So what's C the 4 of? C is the 4 of G, so that means I'm playing G melodic minor over C7. If you listen to everything I just said there, that is a lot of content to take in. And if you're improvising on stage with people who are playing a fast tempo, you've already gotten lost. You know? So just saying to yourself, C7 sharp 11, you execute and you play immediately, and you have the resolution built into um, where your extension is going to go to color your chord. You know, rather having the abstraction of, of a scale or a mode and thinking about these complex concepts that just kind of get in the way of you executing the sound. Um, so if you want to, we're going to take some time now and look at some of these sounds. So let's take a look at dominant 7 sounds. So here you have a dominant 7 sound with a natural 9, 11, and 13. So you'd have your root 3rd and 5th, right, C, G, and we're going to do this all over C just for simplicity's sake, but then you'd apply this to other Cs. C, G, and then you have your B flat here. Your natural 9 is going to be D, which is going to have the tendency to pull here. Your F would be this, and then uh, you'll have your natural 13 here, which will be A. Right? Let's differentiate that and, and contrast that with the 5 chord from harmonic minor. So harmonic minor has, is a dominant 7 chord with a flat 9 and a flat 13. Um, so if we want to figure out what that is real quick, then we'd have C, E, G, B flat. You'd have your D flat here as your flat 9, and then you'd have A flat here as your flat 13. So again, in terms of execution of that chord sound, you would just immediately go to it. You're not going to think to yourself, this is harmonic minor and whatever you know, mode this came out of, this came from F harmonic minor for the C7. That's too much thinking. Just execute the sound and play it. And as you look at this, you know, we, we're talking about dominant 7 chords in the moment. You can apply this to any chord quality. So if you wanted to figure out what um, the Phrygian mode is for C, so you'd have a minor 7 chord with a flat 9, 11, and flat 13. So here then you're going to have 1, your minor 3rd, 5, and flat 7. So that'll be C, E flat, G, and B flat. And you're going to have a flat 9, which will be B flat. And you'll have a natural 11, which in this case would be F, and then a flat 13, which would be A flat. And so those, um, the flat 9 and the flat 13 being the characteristic sounds of that mode are going to pull here. The flat 9 is going to pull down into the root, and the flat 13 is going to pull into the fifth. And so with all of these ideas in mind, then, you can take everything that's here and have the flexibility to move in and out of it, um, play directly over chords as you're playing through changes. Um, if you're you know, playing a blues or you're playing a standard or something like that, you can choose the chord sound that you're going to play on any given chord, and then you'll have the voice leading intact in your line to really execute it with clarity and move from chord to chord to get this fabric of harmony, you know, harmony moving in a melodic fashion. Because everything you're doing is derived from the harmony, and everything you're doing has voice leading built into it. You're understanding how uh, the nines are going to resolve into the root, or how the thirteens or, or the elevens are going to resolve into the fifth. And so you have clarity of tone, you have the chord being outlined and clearly executed without you know, a mountain of thinking. It's just very quick and very accessible. You know, so say you had a 2-5-1, so you're playing G minor 7, C7, F major 7. You say to yourself, G minor 7 with a flat 9, and you play the chord sound. You say C7 with a flat 9 and a sharp 11. You execute the sound. You say F major 7, sharp 11, and this would be all said internally. You execute the sound. And so you're weaving together lines out of this. You're thinking about one thing. 
you're not saying to yourself, okay, I wanted a G minor 7 with a flat 9 and a flat 13, I'm going to play Phrygian over this G minor 7. And then I wanted C7 with a natural 9 and a sharp 11, so I went to here, you know, and then I'm going to play F major 7 sharp 11. You know, so if we're going by the scalar form of that, so we are playing G minor 7 here, which would be an E flat major scale, and then we're playing, um, what would this be? It would be G melodic minor over this, and then you're going to, uh, sorry, here you'd be going to your C major scale to play that. It's just way too much thinking, way too complicated. Be direct, straight on the chord. This reconciles all of it. So, <laughs> let, me, let me finish that little, mm. little bit there. This reconciles all of it. It's all right here. You don't have to think about all of this in complexity. And again, if you're composing, you know, and you have the time to sit down and think, then it, all of this can be advantageous. You have, you know, your charts laid in front of you, you have your in instrument, which you can work concepts out and be working through things. Uh, but in an immediate application, such as improvising and playing on stage, you're going to want a simpler system just to, you know, break everything down. And the more you work with this, the more you're going to find that you don't even think in terms of scales anymore. You think in terms of harmony. You know, and if you look at the history of Western music, the primary contribution of Western art music was harmony and harmonic theory. That's something unique to uh, Western music, and it's something that we've utilized and is, and is utilized in jazz as well as classical music and other music. So this is going to help your concept um, of, you know, your harmonic and melodic concept beyond just the gates of, of improvisation, but as well as in the composition. Okay, so next what we're going to do is actually play through some of these sounds, and um, so stay tuned. So now what we're going to go through are several different dominant seven chord sounds, and um, the benefit of this for guitar players specifically is being able to see how this lays out. Uh, if you know just the standard bar chord, this is the C bar chord, what you have here is this is the root, that's the fifth, and then you have root, third, fifth, and root. And so what I was doing with the, with the chord spelling chart here you can apply directly here. So if this is your root, um, and we're going to do a dominant seven chord, you know that flat seven is a whole step below your root, so that's flat seven, one, three, five, and then flat seven is a whole step below your root, so you can go here, but um, it's actually easier to play here on the guitar, uh, play your flat seven, it's a, it's a minor third or three frets above your fifth. So we'll play it there, and then there's your root. So you have root, flat seven, root, three, five, seven root. And then you can apply that. There's your fifth there. There's your root. So flat seven would be there. And if you know the basic arpeggio, your third's there. So you could go root, flat seven, root, three, five, root, flat seven, root, three, five, flat seven, one. And so... Next what we're going to do are dominant seven chords with two extensions. So we're going to go through all the flat nine possibilities. Um, and so let's start there. So you'll have your dominant seven with a flat nine, and then natural eleven. sharp 11. So let's go through a couple with the natural nine now. So this will be um, natural nine with natural eleven. So let's play that. So that's your straight mixolydian sound. Let's do natural nine. With 
with sharp 11. And then um, natural 9 with flat 13. sounds so we'll do the sharp nine with the natural 11 extension or two extensions. And the reason for this is rather than using all seven, mo seven notes that you would in a modal structure, you're isolating specific notes to get specific sounds. So by having only five notes, like certain, like a pentatonic scale of, so of sorts, um, when you're doing the one extension, um, it gives you a very clear sound on each of those chords. And then adding the extra extension and having the space between the nine and the 11 or the nine and the 13 um, makes the playing sound less less scalar in a certain respects, then you can really outline and hear the chord a little more clearly even though you're playing in a linear fashion. So with that in mind then, if you're playing over a C7 chord and you, you think like this, you're not limited to one mode or another or thinking about things. You can just you know, play different modes in and out of each other. So for instance, like you could be playing a flat 9 and then modulate into having a natural 9. It's not because you're thinking about you know, any various mode or anything like that, but it's because that's what your ear's hearing, that's where the line's going, um, and you know you have that choice available to you. You have each of these chord sounds eventually under your control, and you can execute them as you want. So if you want to hear a dominant 7 with a flat 9 and a flat 13, and then you want to brighten it and add the natural 13, there inside of the chord. It's not something you're thinking and searching for some complex modal concept for, but you're just applying it directly to the chord. And so I've been using this positionally here, um, just this basic C bar chord shape. If you know your triads on the whole fretboard, so say you knew C triads throughout the entire fretboard, and then knew them across the fretboard, this concept and apply it anywhere on the fretboard. So it's not like it's limited to a single shape. You know, typically when people learn a mode, they'll learn a physical shape and think that's the mode, but it's uh, modality is much more broad than just some shape that you're playing. Um, modality has to do with the chord and how these key pitches resolve. So if I wanted to play C7 flat 9 right here, more thoroughly, you can play these different sounds comprehensively across the entire fretboard um, and come up with really clear and articulate sounds that are outlining the harmony. So I hope this has been helpful for you, and I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.